This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good evening, South Africa, and welcome to the Sabi Sands in the Great Kruger National Park, where we sit with a very hungry Unkahuma pride. This is Safari Live. This is so exciting. We've managed to find the sausage tree pride. Look at this last dash. This is amazing. Look at that incredible strength. 20 seconds. Here come the cheetah. Unbelievable stuff. I'm just keeping my head on a swivel. You never know what's going to happen next in these situations. Standing by. <laughs> Can you believe this? Good evening, South Africa. I hope that you're well, especially since we get to open with this wonderful shot of Jupiter right here, rising in our skies this afternoon, or this evening, actually. I hope that you're well and brand uh, welcome to a brand new episode of Safari Live right here on SABC3. Now, my name is Trishala, and I'm just one of the guides and naturalists that will take you around and show you the wonderful bush here. And I've got Marcel on camera with me. Now, we are sitting at the hyena den at the moment. You can see it's a little bit windy, so it's a wonderful time out here. Now, we are coming to you from two locations in Africa, that being the Maasai Mara up in Kenya and of course down here in Juma private game reserve on the western flanks of the Kruger National Park now I'm actually feeling quite a warm breeze come through which is very delightful it was about 22 degrees Celsius today well at least right now I think it's picked up just a little bit now I'm pretty excited because we have some hyena friends behind us and they seem to be still around Thank goodness. Anyway, before we get into them and what they're up to at a brand new site, let us have a look about or have a look at what happened last week, especially since we are kind of drawn or torn between the drought and the celebrations of Father's Day. Hi. Last week on Safari Live, the Father's Day show began with Hosanna doing his best to hunt an impala. This time, no luck. The Juma clan rekindled their bonds and reaffirmed the hierarchy at the den. Poor, low-ranking Ribbon <laughs> remains constantly harassed. With the dry season taking hold, we reminded you of the disastrous drought of 2016 and the devastating effects it had not only on the herbivores, but also on our beloved Nkuhuma pride. Meanwhile, in the Mara, Pat kept up with two hunting brothers, whose efforts were rudely ruined. This is Safari Live. Now, last week, we got to spend some time with the hyenas as well. And these hyenas are actually at a different spot at the moment, which is pretty exciting because it means that it's a brand new area and there are cubs here that we haven't seen in a long time. Now, you'll notice that we are in infrared and that's because, of course, that we don't want to disturb them, especially with a beautiful scene like this of suckling little cubs. We don't want to disturb them. Now, we all are in infrared, like I explained for the same purpose. Now also remember that we are completely live and interactive so use that hashtag Safari Live and we can take any of your questions and comments especially about our lovely animals here. Now we are actually sitting with June and her two cubs. Now you would have met June in the past but she has now moved. Now this area is a lot more clear and open so it is sort of a an area where they may be a little bit more vulnerable. And in the past, I have seen elephants interact with these hyenas and becomes quite a frenzy. Very similar to what Brent Leo Smith happened to enjoy quite a while ago with some elephants and wild dogs. Oh, here we go, elephants chasing wild dogs, wild dogs chasing elephants. Trumpeting, pandemonium. Let's just get around to where it's open. Look at that! 
Isn't this incredible, guys? Well, that elephant's really got it in for the wild dog. Fortunately, the wild dogs are a bit quicker than elephants. She's still after the wild dog. Still going, she's just come out of the drainage line behind us. Now the rest of the elephant herd are going in front of us. We've got to be very careful that we don't get in the wrong position and get misplaced aggression from the elephants that are towards the wild dogs. So this is a potentially dangerous situation. We do have to be quite careful here. So if I do want to move away, guys, you just have to bear with me. Because if the wild dogs run towards us and there's an elephant directly behind them like that, we don't want to be in the wrong spot. The wild dogs are right next to us. The ellies have moved off a little bit. Um, here are the dogs running past us. Well, anybody, welcome back. Those very, very crazy scenes of wild dogs uh, competing for water resources in the drought just around the corner. And normally it is the way of predators that do very, very well in dry conditions because the prey uh, do very, very badly. But when it comes to water, elephants trumpet every single time. Well, as I said, we are here with the Unkuhuma pride, a pride that the dynamics are shifting as we go. And they were with the Talamati male not so long ago. There are potentially some cubs on the way, but one male that has been ingrained comes from Mangeni Pride. Let's go have a little look at where he comes from. Bye. The Unkahuma Pride experienced some fascinating social upheavals last year. Two males, riddled with mange and hounded from their natal Mangeni Pride, started following the Juma lions. These frightened young cats hung on the periphery, seemingly desperate to be accepted and possibly protected by the Ngohumas. Their itching skin disease is caused by a mite that burrows into the skin, causing severe itching and inflammation. The young lions have scratched themselves to baldness in patches. For healthy lions living in a well-fed pride, the disease is surmountable. But the extreme stress of hunger and violence for young males forced to independence can make mange fatal. The Inkahumas have been best served by keeping the diseased and contagious orphans on the periphery. The young Mangeni males continued to bide their time, hoping for acceptance, comfort and food. And you are back live with us, everybody. And having a look at the sort of uh, Talamati male, he's so pretty in comparison to those Mangani males covered in mange, sarcoptic mange. We spoke a little bit about it last week. A very, very sad state of affairs and something that does affect all sorts of animals during the drought periods. Lions being very tactile, very touchy-feely as they rub and groom each other. Those Mangeni males looked horrendous for the longest time. But one of them is in the pride now, and you can't really even tell him apart from the rest because his fur has all sort of come back again. And Oak Tree, you want to know how many members in the pride now? Well, including the Mangeni male, and with the loss of Nana, the old girl, a month or two ago, there are 10 lions here. And uh, we do believe that some of them are potentially pregnant. And one of the ladies here by the name of Ridge knows she has actually, as we discovered this morning by looking at her belly, she has got very fresh suckle marks. So the suckle marks indicate that a cub has been suckling. How many, we don't know. It just gets a little bit wet, the fur around the mammary gland, and that indicates that she potentially has cubs. So we're gonna hope we can follow these lions for the next few weeks to see if we can at least find where she's denning. Uh, but they were on the hunt, 
and we saw them attempt a warthog about 45 minutes ago. The warthog, I think, has made it all the way to Johannesburg now, but I'm sure any moment they might get up again. Who knows, they might catch something. You'll have to see after the break, and we'll see you soon. I do know my um, earpiece was unplugged, sorry, by accident, of course. Can I just confirm it's... Welcome back live and good evening. We are currently sitting here on an open clearing looking at various different animals, mainly wildebeest and impala using our thermal flare camera, which means we can pick up the body heat and see them very clearly, even though we're not using any lights on them whatsoever. And why are they here? They are here because the open clearing is a safe haven from predators. Even although wildebeest and impala are diurnal, daytime animals, they do actually have good vision at night. And what they do is they come to an open clearing where they're able to scan and see all around them for predators that may be lurking. And we are actually on a mission to find one of those predators, namely a leopard called Hosanna. Now, my name is Lauren and on camera I do have Davi. And we actually spent all afternoon with Hosanna, a young male leopard, and he just jumped off into the thicket after an impala. So after a little while longer, we are going to go and continue our search for him. But this is a pretty good place to start. There is impala everywhere and, of course, the wildebeest. Now, there's no competition between these two animals, which is why they are found together. They are not competing for any food resources or such like that. So of course, wildebeest are here on Juma Game Reserve, but they're more famous for their massive great migration that they make up in the Maasai Mara in Kenya, which is actually happening right now as we speak. So let's go and learn more about the great migration.
rising on the northwestern edge of the Great Rift Valley and flowing into Lake Victoria some 400 kilometers later, the Mara River is a rich vein of life running through one of the world's most famous wilderness areas. Shaped and fed by African thunderstorms, rapids, pools and banks provide sustenance to myriad creatures. For the wildebeest, zebra and gazelle of the Great Migration, the Mara River is the quencher of thirst and also a fatal gauntlet. The herds must cross the torrent in search of grazing. But beneath the muddy surface lurk some of the world's largest crocodiles. They have been waiting for the migration for almost a year. For those that survive the rapids, rocks and crocodiles, pastures of sweet oat grass await. At least we got to learn a little bit more about the migration there. Now, hyenas like these guys here, oh, let's have a listen. Now, that groan is actually the matriarch, Corky, who is just behind that bush. And that's how she's calling for her cub, Plonk. Now that's how hyenas call. They'll go low to the ground, they go mm. Sort of like a moo, almost like a cow. And then that's what they use to call out the cubs. And that's different from a whoop, which is the other type of vocalization they make, which is one of my favorite sounds out here in the bush. Hello, you all. Look at those striking eyes. And are you gonna yawn for us, June? Oh, just a tiny one. Now, June's two cubs have recently been named, which is pretty exciting. So we have Soto and Tswana. And at the moment, it's pretty hard to see who is who. But those are her cubs' two names. Now, we haven't spent a lot of time with June and her cubs, but we have spent a lot of time with Ribbon and her cub. And Ribbon, Ribbon's cub is named Pedi. And as we see them, I will tell you more about their new names. Nancy, you'd like to know when hyena cubs actually do leave the company of their parents. So let's talk a little bit about the life history of a hyena cub. A little one like this is only about six months old, going on seven. They were first seen at the end of December last year, going into Jan last year. and. This little one will be weaned by the time it is 15 months or so, which is pretty late, later than most mammals. And then after that, it would be fully grown. Now we think that bon both June's cubs are female, so we'll say a female cub would be fully grown at about three years, while a male cub at about two and a half years. And the females will stay within the company of their clan, and so their mother but the males will disperse around that time. Because these males have to disperse because they can't actually mate within their clan. And the most important thing about being a species is to make more of me. So that is number one. Anyway, this is a very peaceful scene and I think they're going to sit tight and with them I will too. But let's go back and have a look at Brent's sighting there with those wild dogs and just how crazy it can get. So you can see that agitation. You can hear that incredible noise the Ellies are making at the wild dogs. And you can see how they've corralled. I mean, even though the chances of a wild dog attacking an elephant are very, 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 very slight, um, the wild dogs are going into the mud there to try to get a drink out of treehouse. I'm not sure where the puppies are there. They are behind the elephants in the distance. Um, there we go. But the adults are drinking, so we're just going to go down to the adults now. Oh, here we go again. Different elephant deciding to get rid of the dogs. 
So we're missing one adult. The pups, are, it looks like they're trying to sneak down towards where we are now. You can see how the elephant's tail is quite rigid when they're disturbed. Isn't that incredible? And they're moving towards where the puppies are. So, I mean, this is just incredible. There's just action everywhere. And there comes the wild dog through the gap. And there we go, it's spotted the dog. And now the big herd's just seen the youngs, the, the puppies. I mean, we don't know where to look. It's every, everything's going on. Don't worry about the puppies, they're generally quick enough to get out of the way, um, which I'm gonna take the opportunity to do. So, as I said, you gotta be careful about being caught in compromising positions. Back live with us, not far away from where the wild dogs and elephant had that fantastic encounter, everybody. And well, we are on Juma, and we just had the entire pride. Juma, which is the roar of the lion. We had all of them calling right now. It's going straight through my body. <sighs> just got to take a deep breath, and hopefully they're going to do it again. They are here. Unfortunately, they've stopped calling, but it is a night, it is dark, they are hungry, they might call again, we hope they will, you might be with us at the time when they do it, but it's amazing how lions can go from moments of activity to moments of complete inactivity, unlike the wild dogs that are constantly moving in the daytime, even when they are sort of still, they're still sort of fidgeting and moving, as the lions go for what we call a proper cat nap. Listening to all the sounds out in the distance, we had a typical leopard sawing a moment ago in the distance, but that didn't bother the lions too much. They just called back and said, you want this territory? come and claim it. And that's how lions declare, declare territories or demarcate them, often through scent marking, but the calling itself is to sort of buffer other lions, to tell them how far away we are, where we are, how many numbers we are, and the strength of our sound. And uh, that is to keep them from conflict, because if they fought all the time, well, there'd be fewer lions. Well, everybody, go and grab yourself a drink. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after this. Guess who we found? I can't believe it. We have found Tengana. And I can't believe it. We've been looking for Hosanna and we found Tengana. Now he's just gone round here. So bear with me. I am going to just stop and give you a better view of him. There we go. Look at Tengana. Ah, oh, just in the area where Hosanna was not so long ago his father is of course approached and i believe the lions are really not too far as well lots of predator activity going on and of course it was tingana's sawing that we could hear because hosanna is not yet making those kind of vocalizations righty he's lying down now which means we are probably going to try and reposition
Welcome back live. Can you believe it? We were just looking for Hosanna, the young male leopard, and we have just came across his father, Tingana, who is 13 years old. Completely not what we expected at all, but as we were sort of searching around in the dark, we could hear the sawing. Now, Hosanna is only three and a half years old and not quite making that territorial sawing vocalization. So we knew there was another leopard in the vicinity and we came across Tingana. So of course, he settled down, he's just lay on the grass here and he's very, very close to a water point. So this is most likely why he's here, to come down and have a drink. Now, Steve is actually not too far away with the lions. So at the moment, we have two leopards that we know of and lions in the immediate vicinity. And of course, nighttime is the time for these predators. They are all primarily nocturnal, even although they're active during the day and they can hunt during the day, they're primarily nocturnal. This is when they come alive. The cats will be very sleepy during the day. And as soon as that sun goes down, they of course become far more active, wide awake, and this is the main time that they do actually hunt. So we're going to stay with Tangana and see exactly where he's going to go and what he's going to do, but we're going to send you guys across to Steve and his lions. Well done, Lauren. Well, we heard that leopard calling in the distance and well, it's not often that you have, well, I've never noticed lions calling back to leopards. I've had them calling when hyenas shout, uh, but I've never once heard it before with a leopard. But it seems to happen now. Kind of, maybe they're bored. And well, here is one of the lionesses and a couple more lionesses here. And just over to the right are two of the males that are in the pride at the moment. One, it's hard to tell you right now who is who, but one is an actual member of the pride at Nunkuhuma. And another one is one of those Mangeni. But how he got here and how he eradicated his mange and joined the pride, well, there's another story on that. Hi. <laughs> A little while after his brothers arrived, a third Mangeni male tried to join the Inkahumas. The new lion was also riddled with mange. All three wretched Mangeni males lurked on the fringes, hoping for comfort and maybe a meal. Buffalo are an Inkuhuma speciality, but they've been scarce since the drought of 2016. This herd came looking for water, but instead found an augmented and hungry pride in the winter woodland. Perhaps the pride was rusty or lacked cohesion while the younger members learned the buffalo hunting trade. Whatever the case, the angry herd was too wily and too united to be intimidated by the hungry Nkuhumas and their hangers-on. The hunt was unsuccessful. As the pride consoled each other, the Mangeni males lay down in famished dejection. And welcome back live once again, everybody. We're, we are watching some sleepy lions. And of course, not far away, we spoke about the watering hole debacle with wild dogs and elephants. It's one of those things that happens in the drought time when animals compete for resources and water being one of those very, very important lifelines for all mammals and many, many other organisms. It is the currency of life after all. But we were framing up on the males there, two males here. It's very hard to distinguish between the two. And uh, you saw the clips of the of the Mangeni males before with lots and lots of mange. Well, we spent a lot of time with them as they tried to ingratiate themselves in the pride. Uh, they did sort of hang around the periphery for quite some time looking very, very uncomfortable, very, very worse for wear. And uh, well, as I said, now it's very hard to tell anybody apart. 
But uh, the Unkuhumas are a buffalo hunting team. Uh, but with young males hanging around on the outside, sometimes things don't always go their way. So we've got adult, one adult male here drinking. And just above, we've got that really large group of elephants. The puppies are beyond those elephants. We've got another group of elephants on the edge of the wall there. And then we've got an adult female wild dog directly in front of us. Here comes the third adult. I wonder when the youngsters are going to try to sneak through. But elephants are coming back. It seems the dogs keep choosing to run towards us. See how they lift their heads and corral. Okay. See, very focused on the dogs. The third adult has just arrived and trying to get a drink. And the elephants don't seem to want to share the water hole. And they're the puppies, Chandra. They've just popped up behind us. Trying to pull puppies when we get down and have a drink. Isn't this incredible, guys? Well, Tsingana here hasn't been quite as vocal. He has quietened down and he appears to be listening more than actively using his sawing noise, that rasping sawing noise that territorial leopards make. He's listening to everything that is going on around him. And of course, he will hear a lot better than we will hear. Leopards have sharp senses. You can see the reflective glow on his eyes there. That's a special layer that they have on their retina, which reflects light twice and allows them to see in dark conditions far more than us humans can see. So this leopard is of course equipped for being a nocturnal animal and right now he just appears to be listening. There is no way he will not know that other leopards and lions are around. Taylor is asking how much does a leopard weigh well? Males and females are actually drastically different. Female leopards are far more slender and lighter. So they normally range between 30 to 60 kilograms, somewhere in that region for a female leopard. Male leopards are much more muscular. They have a bigger sort of stance, a heavy dewlap coming under their chin, and they range in the region of 60 to 90 kilograms. However, 90 is very big for a leopard. Not all male leopards around here will be as heavy or as big as 90 kilograms. Now, I did mention earlier Tingana's 13 years old. Leopards generally tend to live from between 11 to 15 years old. So although he's still a dominant, fantastic territorial male, of course, he is reaching just that end part of his life. And sooner or later, he may not be as strong or as heavy as he is right now, especially compared to his son, who it does not have that big dewlap like he does, and his son is definitely not as big as he is. So while we stay here with the Duke of Juma, we are going to send you across to Trish with the leopard's worst enemy. It seems like all Juma royalty is out and about this evening. And there is Corky, our matriarch. Now she slipped her, her way in here and found her way into the bushes and has sat down nicely. And her little one, Plonk, who I'm really dying to spend some time with, is tucked there against her belly. Now another clan male, Tsaka, came by. Now we've been talking about males and how they need to disperse from their clan while females don't. And he leads quite a different life, or um, sort of a disadvantaged life, shall we say, compared to the female hyenas. Now, you know that they are matriarchal. In fact, we can discuss a little bit more about that in a bit. But let's discuss even their size difference, which is so drastic. Female hyenas get to about 70 kgs, possibly much more. I've seen the huge hyenas. And males only about 60 kgs. But that too, they're obviously 
differences. Well, I hope that Clan Meltaka comes by again and he does sound like he's rustling among the bushes. So hopefully we'll be back and he'll be here. Hello everybody, we are with the Lions that are now all deciding, of course, while the ad break is on, that they've had enough of sitting in the long, well, on the, the short grass, and they're going to do some beautiful cat stretches and yawns, and slowly start moving in to the thickets. Oh, are you now? It all just takes one to move, and there they go. Oh, and feel that stretch, can't you? And they're definitely hungry, but they are headed south now. Um, but they're also headed directly towards the old hyena den. So we're going to see if we can keep up with them. Let's go for it, Craggy. <laughs> So, how do we get through here? We're not far away from... Oh, they're going to go straight to Treehouse Dam now, as suggested before. So I'm just going to go on that little road over there. Good evening. are directly here in front of us. This is a nice two-track. again with us live everybody on the two track that is headed directly towards the original Juma clan den sites and this lioness is not enjoying having her ears, her ears licked that's probably amber eyes she's a very grumpy girl she is the most non touchy feely of the pride one of the reasons why mange is so easily spread between lions because of all of this licking and touching and the tactile communication we talk about and ian you want to know if lions get a sore throat from the roaring well i've never known a lion to go to the doctor to get any throat lozenges it's a part and parcel of what they have their throat is very well designed actually they've got these very special muscles inside the chest all of the panthera do leopards tigers uh, jack um jaguars and lions got this very special um design inside the chest that allows them to call very very loudly it's why they all fall under the genus panthera um, they also have that purring that they do, but the loud, loud roar is the characteristic sort of feature, obviously, of the African lion. And initially, I thought they were finally getting up to go down to pass the den site, because this little track goes straight past the den towards Treehouse Dam. 
and uh, Treehouse Dam is exactly where that um, situation with the elephants and the wild dogs played out. There we go. <laughs> First winning here. The wild dog knows it's much faster than the elephants. So this is that other male just trying to get in for a drink, and every time he sort of gets and has a half a lap, the elephants are oh, the off the puppies. Oh, there's just too much going on. Here we go again. Uh, it looks like the elephants might move off now and the wild dogs might come in for a drink. The puppies, that could be quite spectacular, all of them in this little mud wallow. And I'm sure a lot of you can see why this is my favorite animal, just the pure excitement that they create wherever they go. You can see how they don't know how much water's in there and they quite nervously approach. Oh, there we go, happy puppies. Just look at that lapping. Oh, incoming Ellie. Scatter pups. <laughs> These elephants really don't like the dogs around. I mean, it's consistent pushing of them. The elephants are just in front of us. We've still got one of the adult dogs to our right, the adult female, just here and the rest of them are up ahead. Oh, it is just so magical to have these animals around. What an epic wild dog sighting. It was absolutely insane, the trumpeting and growling of those elephant herds as they chased the wild dogs up and down, and this has definitely been one of my best sightings since I've been at Safari Live. What an incredible sighting that was that Brent had. And it really shows you how water dependent animals really struggle when there's a scarce, when the water is scarce. And that does happen out here in South Africa in Juma when it comes to winter. It becomes very dry, lots of water holes dry up and animals struggle for a good source of water. Their movements become predictable because they all come to the guaranteed spots where they can come and have a drink like Tingan here who has just came down to a dam that is slowly drying up and he's drinking and he's not stopped drinking for the past few minutes he's obviously replenishing all his water requirements he's probably dehydrated himself a little bit throughout the day and of course he's just lapping up all the water at this dam now in some maybe a few more weeks this dam will actually dry up completely because we are about to go into the real height of winter i'm afraid so all the animals that are water dependent will of course have to rely on different water points that are guaranteed to deliver so of course here in juma water is becoming scarce winter is here but <laughs> amazing that's him sawing that's his territorial noise called a saw so yes water may be scarce here but up in the Maasai Mara in Kenya at this time of year the water of the Mara River is absolutely flowing causing many problems for those animals that wish to cross so let's go and take a look at what Taylor saw up during the Great Migration Now, we're still waiting for the zebra to make their move. There are a couple of wildebeest in and between the stripes. However, this is a constant game of back and forth, and it must be a very, very daunting experience for the zebra, for the wildebeest, and any other animals to try and cross the Mara River. There are so many obstacles that they have to face, not only the fast-flowing water, but also the slippery rocks, and not to mention the crocodiles that get bigger than 15 feet, and they've got lots and lots of teeth. But it looks Looks like they're heading back down again. They might also just be going in to quench their thirst. It's exceptionally warm at the moment. 
All they need is one to make the plunge and the rest will follow. This is so exciting. Massive aggregations of zebra form the vanguard of the Great Migration. They advance in front of a vast wave of wildebeest and Thompson's gazelle, cropping the grass for those behind them. As for all the migrating herbivores, one of the greatest perils is the skulking terror below the surface of the river. Some will provide the first migration meal for the patient reptiles. Others will defend themselves. Zebras have a vicious bite and a mighty kick. This one will live to fight another day. The Mara River is, of course, the bloodline of the Mara. It is so important for so many of the animals there and pr presents so many challenges for those to wish to cross. Talking of crossing, Tangana is crossing this little dam right in front of us, and it appears he's got some sort of limp, or he looks a little bit stiff on his hind legs. So he's going past our vehicle right now, and he's heading up. So we're going to have to turn around and, of course, follow him carefully. We'll be driving across a dried up dam, so it's a little bit bumpy. Tina's asking, would a leopard risk harm to in order to catch prey during a hunt? Well, actually, that's a very good question because leopards are, of course, territorial and solitary. So they actually live their life on their own. You will only see leopards. Oh, just got him here. I'm just going to stop and give him some space. He's right in front of our vehicle. The only time you will see leopards together is when they're mating or mothers with cubs. Other than that, they live a solitary life, so it's really important that they actually don't risk harm. They make sure they're not going to get in harm's way as much as they can, especially from sort of impala horns or a kick in the face from a stronger animal, because they cannot risk injury, they cannot risk not being able to hunt for some time, especially when you can get secondary infections, maybe they can't feed for a few days. So for a leopard, because you're out here on your own it's really important that you've actually got to protect yourself from harm so you can see he's just gone through the thicket there i think we might have to follow him in order to not lose sights of tingana so if we just move forward a little bit he's going up a termite mound we will be able to follow him so of we're going to keep up with Tangana. Who knows what he's going to get up to? We're going to go for a short ad break, but don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Don't come back to my face, please. I have something stuck in my eye. <laughs> well, we're back live and 
I told you so much was happening. There was Taka running around, and now it seems that Corky is out and about. I can't tell who's here, but the adults that we have at the moment in front of us are Pretty and Corky, and Corky's son Plonk, that I was so dying to see, is somewhere off to our left. At least he was. Ah, there's one of them. And he's been bossing around the other two cubs, those being Pretty's cubs that are also bounding about here. Yeah? And they got very, very curious. They came right up to the vehicle and of course my shoes, which they particularly like. Luckily for them, I like them too. Now we spoke about the fact that this is a brand new area that we're finding them in. The last couple times on our previous episodes, we had them in a different den, but in fact, now they are in a completely new space. In fact, you can't even tell it's a den. It's just sort of an open area and a bit of a drainage on the other side. Well, I'm gonna reposition and hopefully I'll catch up with them. We also don't want to light them up. But while I do that, I think, let us have a last look at Taylor's upgrade. Anmara. We're back at Maine South and over the past couple of weeks it has really proven to be a popular crossing point with the zebra and the wildebeest. But sometimes there's predators lurking in the long grass and there's a lioness hidden behind all that tall stuff. Although she seems to be in quite a deep sleep at the moment. She's definitely been hanging around over the last couple of weeks using the croton thicket in her favor, not just to hide from the harsh African sun, but also to plan the perfect ambush attack. But the lions aren't the only ones that are around here. There's also the North clan of hyenas. And even though Maine South has proven to be a particularly easy crossing in the sense that the water is not so deep, the banks are not too steep, and the rocks aren't too slippery. And just a couple of days ago, we witnessed the most spectacular sighting I have ever seen here at Maine South. A lone zebra finally crashed towards the river, chased by a paradise pride lioness, right into the jaws of a waiting crocodile. For a while, the lioness watched as her meal fought. Perhaps she too was impressed with the immense courage displayed in the face of unspeakable odds. But the zebra's determination and will to survive somehow held out. A zebra is a thousand pounds of explosive power. As his hooves found purchase on the riverbed, the crocs faltered, giving their victim the tiny gap he needed to escape. Sadly, with a broken fetlock. It's not every day that you get to see a zebra escape from the powerful jaws of a crocodile. And it wasn't just one crocodile, it was many of those prehistoric creatures. I honestly thought that that zebra was a goner. It didn't just face one gauntlet, it faced three. The murky Mara waters, the lioness, and then the crocodiles. Once that zebra made it safely to the other side of the Mara River, we noticed that it had sustained some serious injuries. It looked like the fetlock was perhaps injured, but it was evident that it wasn't able to use its legs very well. Well, you are back, of course, and well, our lions have moved into a very thick, pen impenetrable area. We're trying to keep up with them. There is another vehicle joined us in the sighting. Oh, they're walking along this very, very tricky drainage line that'll take us back down to the Mawati drainage system, which runs through the heart of Juma. Well, you'll notice the pride is walking together as one. Uh, we had them together lying together as one. And you'll notice how the Mangani male has just completely ingratiated himself in that pride. He looks like one of them, he behaves like one of them, and, well, that is the way the story is going to end. Last year, three mange-infested young lions tried to join the Inkahuma pride. The homeless, hungry males had recently been kicked out of their natal Mangeni pride. Now, only one Mangeni male remains. We aren't sure what happened to the others or the young Talamati male. 
His mange has almost cleared, although he continues to sport fresh wounds. Life for teenage male lions is always difficult, especially for a lion used to the comforts of a pride. Lately, however, it seems as if the Ngohumas might tolerate his presence. Finally, the pride is affectionate and accepting. The young Ngohuma male would do well to forge a coalition with this courageous and determined lion. The migration is just incredible. I did spend some time up in the Maasai Mara and I saw my first ever zebra crossing of around 500 zebras. And it is absolutely out of this world. And of course, the migration is gonna hit its peaks very soon and we will be broadcasting live from there in the up and coming weeks. So Mr. Tangana here is on the move and you will not believe what he has been doing. He has been smelling and following the path of his son and we are going to lose him a little bit through the thicket but if we uh, might have to go a little bit forward to try and see if we can give you a better view of him before this fantastic bumble does end we may have to use our there we go. let me just scan around and see where he has gone He's some here somewhere. Tingana, where have you disappeared to? Now we avoid using spotlights, but sometimes we just do a quick scan to see if we can see the animal through the thicket. And it's not looking too good. Has he evaded us? This is very possible. Last minute escape. Of course, he will continue patrolling and walking around all night long. But we, of course, will have to go. We must say thank you so much for joining us on this absolutely incredible bumble where we had lions, leopard, a very unexpected leopard, hyenas, and so much more. So, I think one last scan. And off into the night, Tingana has gone. So thank you for all your comments and questions. And do make sure you jump on board our vehicles the same time, same place next week.